he started life as the film festival showing films by women from all over the world and we are now in 2015 we pivoted um to being a mission to bring ever greater audiences to films by women across the uk uh in 2018 we established uh our mission which is called reclaim the frame uh hopefully you understand what that means which is specifically about lifting up the female perspective in film um we're all people who work in in the industry and have for a long time so it's about affecting change by giving back using our own influence to change things for us it's about who tells the story is where the power lies so for us it's about films by women written by women directed by women and we have networks across the UK. So actually, hopefully there's lots of people who are from the different cities in which we work um, across the UK. We have networks in 12 cities. Uh, many of the cinemas who we work with, our beloved cinemas are closed, obviously because of the pandemic. So we pivoted quickly to doing this work online. Um, mm -hmm. I saw the assistant in Sundance and absolutely loved it and and actually I'm a big fan of Kitty Green's work from having seen casting John Bonet and Ukra Ukraine is not a brothel which are our previous films so we're going to talk mainly about the assistant um but we're also going to cover some of uh, her other work and her inspiration and I'm really looking forward to this conversation so welcome Kitty it's lovely to meet you um thank you in from Melbourne uh yeah um, yeah I, Thank you. Uh, sorry, my sound's a little weird. I think you're good. We can hear you. I think um, so. Before we get into our conversation, Kitty, I'm just okay, going to cool. pass to Sonia Zadurian, who is the curator at the Barbican Cinema, and she would have loved to have been screening this film on the big screen. But now, of course, we have a digital only release, but we can still all. Um, our, our alliances are really important to lift up films like this. So I would like to pass over to Sonia to say uh, a welcome and to contextualise the film before we have a conversation with you. Lovely. Hi both um, and hello to our audience. Um, I'm really, really delighted to be introducing this conversation today um, between Mia Bayes, director of Birds Eye View, and obviously Kitty Green, director of The Assistant. At the Barbican Centre, we regularly work with Bird's Eye View on their fantastic Reclaim the Frame campaign, which you've just heard more about from Mia. Um, in the past, we've worked together on screen talks around films such as Wild Rose, Booksmart and Atlantics. Um, and with the Barbican Centre unfortunately temporarily closed, we are really pleased to be continuing this relationship online, um, especially with a film we feel so strongly about. Um, when I was a teenager dreaming about the film industry and desperate to get into this exciting world, I read a book by Peter Biskind called Down and Dirty Pictures about a film company called Miramax and the boom of independent film starting in the late 80s and going on into the early 2000s. The book doesn't cover what has now come to light since the Me Too movement, but it does talk a lot about Harvey Weinstein and his foolish behaviour. I was appalled by what I read about Harvey Weinstein's aggressive, intimidating and abusive behaviour. In my naivety, I couldn't understand why people allowed him to behave in this way. Little did I know then how much worse things were behind the scenes, that he had fostered a, relation, uh, a workplace environment and a culture that allowed him to sexually harass and rape women. As I hope many of you will have seen by now, uh, Kitty Green's The Assistant is a fascinating and disturbing insight into a day in the life of an office assistant, uh, Jane, played by Julia Garner, in a prominent and hugely successful film company in New York. The head of the company is an abusive man who maintains a fearful atmosphere in the office and appears to show an interest in furthering the careers of young and beautiful women. Names are never named, but the parallels are clear. And in Kitty's research for the assistant, she interviewed friends and former employees of the Weinstein Company and Miramax. Although clearly inspired by the events of one company in particular, crucially, the shadowy figurehead of this organization is never seen. This really allows for the film to speak to a larger systemic problem that did not begin or end with just one company or just one man. The culture of silence enforced by those in power is not unique to Weinstein, but it's something that he relied on. 
it wasn't just present in those he abused, but also in those who worked with or for him. An unwritten rule that you had to abide by or choose to leave the company and potentially the industry. It's this notion that the assistant demonstrates so delicately. Um, in one brilliant scene, Jane attempts to blow the whistle on some of the inappropriate behaviour she's observed by talking to a senior member of staff. What ensues is a subtly threatening and insidious conversation, a disturbing masterclass in how easy it can be to silence those without power. The film provokes so many conversations around Me Too, sexism in the workplace, uh, women's voices in film, and many more. And I'm really um, eager to listen to Mia and Kitty's discussion. Um, I'm going to hand over to Mia in a moment, but first I would like to say a big thank you to Bird's Eye View for staging this discussion and allowing me to introduce it. And also a big thank you to you, our audience, for tuning in and supporting this brilliant and important film. I'd like to leave you with a quote from Down and Dirty Pictures, which was published in 2004, 13 years before Me Too exploded and the Harvey Weinstein sexual abuse allegations were brought to the fore. This is from page three. By virtue of the volume of its output, it is by far the largest employer of above the line talent and below the line crew in New York City. Staffers are afraid that if they talk, they'll lose their jobs and find themselves blackballed from future employment. Directors fear that if they put themselves on the Weinstein's bad side, they won't be handed that next hot Nicole Kidman film or any film at all. Writers wonder if they'll be able to sell their latest script. Actors worry that they won't be hired for the coveted role. As director James Ivory puts it, a lot of people are afraid to speak out directors, actors and actresses, and other people who eventually might end up in his hands again. They're not going to talk. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Sonia. So welcome, Kitty from Melbourne. How? Before we get into our conversation about your amazing film and your wonderful previous work too, um, what's it like in Melbourne? Uh, Melbourne's pre doing pretty well, to be honest. It's pretty safe and we seem to have things under control. Let's hope it kind of keeps going that way. So, yeah, it's, it's like I can't complain. And how are you managing to work? Uh, I'm not sure anyone's getting much work done, I think, in this period. It's a little confusing and I think we just have to take a beat and kind of be gentle with one another and, you know, um, yeah, slow things down a little bit. Exactly. So it's wonderful to forget that and, and go back, go into Kitty Green world for an hour because I think it's a very uh, intense and interesting world. So I think there's a lot of stuff that we can talk about. First about the, the film and how you developed it. And, and there's just so much stuff to talk around. Also the techniques that you employed. And I'm really fascinated then to go into your documentary work, which is also quite radical with form. So, um, so if, and I also wanted to ask about your, your inspirations, particularly from a female director and writer point of view, but we'll get to that bit. Um, so first of all, Kitty, you, I, I read that you were initially developing a project about consent and institutional power. So can you talk a little bit about the kind of journey to what you were doing then, where that intention came from and how you then kind of pivoted? Yeah, I mean, it started, I think, I, 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 there's a few, I, it's a difficult kind of journey because there's a lot of things that influence a project like this. But I began, I, I said, like to think, it began when I went to Sundance Film Festival with my last feature film. And when I was there, I was very excited to have a film in Sundance. It was very exciting for me. And the first question I got, like I did, a I had a bunch of interviews lined up. And the first, first question from the press, first question I got was, who gives you your ideas? Is it James Seamus or Scott McCauley? And they're my two male producers. So immediately I was shocked that someone was there. I was like, what do you mean by who gives you your ideas? And they said, no, who do you go to for the ideas? Do you go to James or do you go to Scott? And there was a kind of a question after question at that. It wasn't Sundance as well, but it was just the journalists I was getting were kind of very kind of sexist. And there was a lot of misogynist kind of undertones to what people were saying and there was a lot of assumptions that I wasn't really in control or people would be uh, kind of like I don't know I just I felt very uncomfortable and by the end of it I felt a little rattled like 
should I be made? Is there a place for me in the film industry? Do I belong here? Will people ever believe that I've created my own work? Like, what is the path here? And I started speaking to my friends about their experiences as, a, as women in the film industry and what they, and kind of the everyday kind of, I was specifically looking at gendered kind of biases and gender division of labor and what they were, the way they were being treated versus their male colleagues. So I kind of, all these conversations were being thrown around and I went, started, I didn't know what to do with it necessarily. And I went to a college campus, the themes essentially, to a college campus kind of tour on the US. Cause at the time that's where we were talking about misconduct and power structures. And those conversations were being had on college campuses before kind of the rise of the Me Too movement when it became kind of more mainstream, I guess. So I started chatting to college students about these problems on their campuses when, and I was at Stanford and there was a troupe there that were dealing with performance and sexual assault and how to sort of discuss misconduct in through theater and art. And my phone kind of exploded with the Weinstein allegations and everything kind of changed in that moment. And I started making calls to my friends who a few of them worked at the Weinstein company, a few of them worked at other production companies with similar kind of predatory bosses. And, with kind of tyrannical, almost like abusive bosses who weren't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily the sexual nature. Um, I started chatting to them about what it was preventing them to get, get to get into positions of power, essentially. Like what was stopping them from climbing the corporate ladder, where, where they felt there were blockages, what environments kind of support predatory behavior. Like those were kind of the questions I was interested in. And so that became kind of the foundation for the project. It was like the research phase, which then became the screenplay. Um, yeah, that's the long story <laughs> of how I got here. And did you always know that it was going to be fiction? Did you, or, or was there a point when it was documentary? I read a great quote you said about that actually you just knew it would work as a doc. Can you just talk about that? Um, yeah, I never kind of come at a project thinking about the form first. I think right. about what I want to say and what's important yep. and what the message is. And then I try and figure out what's the best way to tell that story. Yep. Um, with this one, I was looking at lots of like microaggressions and behaviors yep. that go unnoticed every day in the workplace. And it was something I knew that in a fiction film you could highlight because of the close up and time and being able to really focus in on those tiny things and amplify them essentially and get them seen like and so and noticed essentially after you know for so long people kind of ignore that kind of behavior so the that became fiction became the best way to tell the story in my opinion um but also there's a few other reasons and one of them was i think a lot of that a lot of what i'm covering has been covered in the press but i felt like we weren't really getting kind of an emotional kind of insight into what 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 kind of toll that takes on a woman like on how it can shatter your self-confidence to have somebody kind of glance at you in the wrong way or say something kind of awful. So yeah, I guess it was, there was a few kind of um, reasons why it became the form that it mm -hmm. is. And how did you develop, how did the writing process work? I mean, you were obviously out in the field quite a lot. I mean, did you actually even embed yourself in an office? Uh, did, you certainly talked to a lot of <laughs> assistants. Can you talk about how? No. Yeah, sorry. How you wrote? Yeah, I started interviewing people that, I mean, I started with the Miramax and the Weinstein company and then kind of went broader to other companies that I knew were still operating. At that time, Weinstein and were no longer functional. So there were still bosses at that point who were working and people that were working for them and had concerns about what they were seeing. So I started speaking to them and I kind of was hearing similar stories no matter where I went. I then spoke to people that worked in studios and agencies and then I spoke to women in finance and tech, and I was specifically interested in entry level positions, no matter what industry you're in almost, I wanted to chat to you if you were kind of starting out and trying to figure out your way through the system. Um, so yeah, it was sort of asking the similar questions about the structure of the day, about kind of when they've tried to speak up and been shot down, like what was their path? So, um, and all of that formed kind of the structure of the character Jane's day, essentially. So it was scripted quite quickly, I think in, in a couple of months, but it was, from stories I'd heard again and again, and the patterns were kind of what informed the script. I love films that have got a really clear timeline. And so when did you decide that it was gonna be a day? Was that from the beginning? Can you talk about the kind of pros and cons of that? Yeah, I mean, the first, I think I decided, I was in London actually, and I said to a friend, he asked what I was working on, and I said, oh, it's about an assistant that works for a predatory boss. And my friend said, oh, the enablers in this way that I found, oh, that sounds so evil. And what I'm talking about is a woman in a very complex position and it's not 
she's not just enabling all day. She's trying to get her job done and trying to figure out how she fits in and trying to figure out what's going on. So that made me want to make sure it was an authentic day as if she, what she would experience on the job so that everything coming her way, whether it's taking, making the coffee or dealing with a photocopier or dealing with something that's quite suspicious and concerning kind of had equal dramatic weight because that is the way that she would experience it as she goes about her day. So that became kind of the, I mean, immediately, I think in that moment, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And then just trying to convince everyone that that was something they wanted to fund and finance and get made when it is a lot of sort of banal activities uh, was the challenge, essentially. Yeah, I mean, how was that? How was the financing process? Because I'm sure there must have been as many people who were scared of touching it as there were maybe funders who were drawn to, to the material. Can you talk about the experience of that? Yeah, it was really tough. Um, yeah. like I knew it was a touchy subject, but I think I think anyone that took it on would have to be make sure their office wasn't a terrible place, have to have a strong right. HR department especially. Like I think a lot of you, you don't know why certain people reject it, but you often get the female employees wanting to do it. And then what we'd have is their male employees the next day refusing and them sending us an email going, I'm so sorry, I can't get my male colleagues on board. And that happened again and again and again. Um, and we heard about one place that felt ha that had kind of a shaky HR department. And so perhaps that was the real, you know, those sorts of issues kind of pop up because you really have to do some introspection in order to take something like this on. And oh, so much of it is about behavior that still continues today. Like it's not something that ended with, me too kind of the rise of the me too movement it's still going on so yeah i think it is a little uncomfortable for a lot of people i mean i started in film as an assistant and and i celebrate 30 years next year and thank god never worked for anyone like him um like the kind of boss but there's a lots of people who kind of aspired to that sort of behavior and they're what and and what's so fascinating is the complicity that is, and and I I remember hearing it so many times, and then I even remember saying, well, you know, that it's kind of worth it, and that you should be grateful. And so there's that devastating the Matthew McFadden HR conversation is just devastating because that sort of I felt found that very triggering mm. <laughs> because of what you're being what what, and it's not just in film either. Can you just talk about? How, yeah, how you sort of map, you know, those moments because they just feel so deeply authentic. Uh, with Matthew, or do you mean it, or in the film overall? Just in the film overall, actually, like in a way that, so, well, maybe just let's talk about that moment because mm. that's really the only proper conversation she really had, isn't it? Yeah, it's a big chunk of the film. It's a 12-minute 12 page scene, so 12 pages of script and 12 minutes. Um, so it is the longest, di definitely there's barely any dialogue in the movie besides it. So yeah, it was a difficult task. And um, it was one that I always knew would be kind of the center of the story, like kind of the, the centerpiece of the film. And uh, it is kind of almost the most dramatic kind of scene in the film. Um, so it was something we wanted to get right and not to, uh, it was a really tricky balance because immediately when you start drafting it, it's very easy to make him evil and in, and and kind of angry and abusive and swearing and all that stuff. And I think an original draft, my early drafts, had him kind of more angry. And then it's slowly dawned on me that kind of the more calm and reasonable and rational he is, the more insidious it is in a lot of ways. And it, it was there for a a couple of reasons. The first one was I wanted to demonstrate how HR departments are there to protect the companies and not the employees. And the second one was I really wanted an example of gaslighting in yeah. the film. And I think that is a very clear kind of picture of what that can look like. She walks in with a concern um, and she's immediately, she walks out not knowing why she even walked in in the first place and confused about her own role in everything. So um, it was, yeah, kind of a journey to get it to feel, to have all those beats. But Matthew, it, I mean, Julia is incredible. We haven't spoken about Julia yet. Julia is yes. amazing. Uh, but Matthew is so great too. So the two of them were like, worked so well together and just kept, it was just got richer and richer every time they did a take. And just there's something, they would just mine those words for everything in them and be able to kind of create such texture and depth. And it was, it was a real thrill to have him on board. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yes, Julia Garner. I've become obsessed with her in Ozark. So to watch her in this, I mean, God, it's radically different part, but she is just the, the, she just does so much with her expression and her eyes. And the thing, the performance, the part of the performance that really struck me the most is like you just talked about gaslighting and the scene where after Math, she's had that conversation with, with HR and she has to, uh, she gets bored out and then she has to apologize and she emails and then she gets the email back. And her eyes, we watch the effect of gaslighting in that mm. performance. Yeah. Because he's gaslighting her through that email when he says, um, the uh, you're good, you're very good, I'm tough on you because I'm going to make you great. And her expression is devastating because it's sort of, she's being, she's being fobbed off. And it is, it's like, look, we're literally watching the the effect of gaslighting. And how, how did you do that with her? Oh, yeah. I mean, she, I don't know, with her, it, it was, we had a very short shoot. We had 18 days to shoot the film. Wow. So we knew, I knew we needed a long rehearsal process and a lot of time, a lot of conversations beforehand, a lot of, so we needed to know exactly what we needed by the time we got on that set. Um, so yet yeah, luckily she agreed to that, which was exciting. And we, the two of us spent kind of a month figuring out emotionally where that char character was at at any given moment. And we spoke to a few former assistants together and we kind of, and we got her to do a bunch of kind of, she spent some time in her manager's office kind of observing people. So we did a bunch of different things to get her ready. Um, but yeah, there's just so much going on. I mean, her eyes, I mean, I thought a lot of the film would be shot, to be honest, in, in wider shots. And then I remember the first day just watching her in close up, mm -hmm. so much was going on that I realized, oh no, we have to be right in there for a lot of this movie. And we actually hadn't scripted the other sides of the phone calls because I assumed you'd never hear the other side of them because it'd be in wide, so you just hear like a rumble. But because we're in so close, we ended up having to record all of those in post-production while, while we were editing the other sides of the phone call so you could hear them because it made no sense. We were so close in on our face to not hear what was being said. Um, so it was kind of a, a journey of discovery, but the two, it was a really lovely kind of collaborative process, to be honest. And I haven't worked that closely with one actor before. She's in every scene. She's like, it's, she's in every, almost every shot. So um, yeah, it was a journey, but I really, she's such so brilliant and so, uh, I don't know, just, I don't know. She just sort of gets she, how to, I don't know, it's such a skill being able to depict everything that's going on in your eyes, you know, essentially. Yeah. Uh, but she's got it. She's brilliant. Yeah. I mean, even the way, just like the simple, uh, there were just some really beautiful details, like the, the when she gets into the office and she takes that particular mug and just, she just gives us so much. I just thought simple details like that. I can't remember what it says. It says, says big hug mug or something yeah, yeah. right yeah and just the little things that that choice communicates and also just there's something about her her what she imbues that really makes us really want to watch we're really hooked even in something that's kind of seemingly banal yeah, that's what I said to the casting agent. I said, we need someone infinitely watchable because essentially she's going to be doing the most mundane tasks. So you don't want to watch the copy machine. You want to watch her face. So, and she, the name that she brought up was Julia's and I think it was a brilliant suggestion. She's, yeah, it works because she's so striking essentially. Yes. And can you talk a bit about um, the mise-en-scene and, and like there's so many wonderful choices you talked a bit about shooting I love how much you kind of shoot down on her it's sort of a kind of ominous camera position you know like the way where the camera is we feel like we shouldn't be watching almost as well it's uncomfortably close the lighting is just so sinister <laughs> that place is sinister can you talk about all those decisions Right, yeah. I mean, I worked with the same cinematographer since film school and we went to film school together and we were housemates in Melbourne. So we know each other so well and I knew we had a short shoot so I needed someone I had that kind of relationship with. So I brought him on board for this and he's um, really a beautiful, beautifully lights and understands. So we, the two of us kind of did a lot of referencing stuff early on, thinking about um, we a lot of Fincher actually, like um, Zodiac. Wow. 
and master what's it mind hunter you know those kind of shows that have these very kind of fluorescent light drab offices generally they're police <laughs> police yep. like you know stations but this was um it, we did it, we were influenced by that to be honest to give it kind of an oppressive eerie vibe without kind of making it feel like a horror movie like it was kind of a line we had to walk where we needed it to be daytime we needed it to be fluorescent lights but we also needed mood um and so that became kind of a tricky balance but um something that i think we pulled off because but it was and with her and the blocking and the frame it became about almost letting the office kind of swallow her up like you can kind of see yeah. her head getting lower and lower and lower as we go and the kind of office is kind of sort of towers above her towards especially towards the hr scene i think before she walks in there we've got like quite a lot of headroom As, and so it is all those angles and shots were kind of thought through quite carefully i love storyboarding and so i often draw all these little stick figures and pictures and try and create kind of the world on paper before we get onto the set which was great because we didn't have any time so often it was just like okay just do what we, what we drew you know months earlier um mm -hmm. it worked yeah um, a question from Jason Wood, who's a creative director um, in film at Home Cinema in Manchester, who's a, which is a wonderful cinema we work with a lot, who would definitely have been screening this film on their big screen. Um, but So he sent a great question, which is, everyone in the office is both aware and fearful, but seemingly gripped by the news for, for us and the drive for self-preservation. Is this sense of self-preservation something that you wish to explore because it goes beyond, I think, just the need for people to not waste a good job opportunity. So can you talk about complicity? Yeah, I mean, I'll disagree with that statement a little bit because we don't, okay. we're experiencing the world through her eyes. We're only seeing what she, through her perspective, essentially. Yeah. And she's trying to figure out who in that office knows what, like who knows what's going on behind that door, who's aware what uh, to what level are they aware i'm sure a lot of people thought that he was sleeping around this boss but didn't understand the level of consent is it consensual yeah. or is it are these yeah. people willing participants in this kind of scheme so i think a lot of it the blurriness of it and the fact that there is this kind of culture of silence and people aren't speaking to each other about the bits and pieces they know means no one can really join the dots and no one can really prove exactly what's going on behind there so it is it's a really difficult kind of machinery i guess he that he's to to discuss i mean it's really difficult it's really kind of uh how do i explain it but i mean it's sort of a complex situation for everyone involved i don't think it's clear cut anyway so i think there are people that definitely probably knew more than they should and i think that perhaps it is something where you know where where, where maybe i don't know to be honest i can't say they are definitely i don't know we're just experiencing the world as yeah. she knows it. so it is it is complicated and gets really tricky to talk about but I think they're, everyone in that office, it's a very abusive office environment in the film depicted. I mean, he's yelling at the boys, he's kind of throwing yeah. things. Like, so I think everyone is sort of a victim of this toxic work environment, but we're trying to figure out what people know exactly about the extent of it and how, how bad it is and the level to which, you know, how corrosive he, his power is essentially. So that was what we were exploring. Um, but yeah, it's really tricky, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. Um, can we talk about consent and, and, Oh, it's very complicated, isn't it? The the consent in relation to, you know, that kind of power and how little choice, perhaps, like the the actresses we see, like the way that you depict that, and also when we feel it so pa painfully when she's photocopying all of the all of the headshots, and it just doesn't feel like. Yeah, there's no power on behalf of those women coming in. And, oh, it's so complicated what you've done there, Kitty. Can you just talk about sort of what, what, yeah, what, what are you wanting us to take away from this? Because it feels like you're saying something really big on many levels. Yeah. I mean, it's really tricky. It's really tricky terrain to wander into because it's so, it's so sensitive and there's a lot of people who've, uh, I've, I've, are frankly traumatized from a really awful, awful experiences. So it is about trying to find a way. And when I was approaching the subject, I was thinking, well, how can I find a way where we can explore, not just, ju not just show this, just how heinous this is, but explore how, what kind of system surrounds this, yeah. and what it will take to unpick this, which, which isn't just getting rid of the predators and saying, well, he's gone, he's out, it's, it's yeah. fixed. 
I think if you let a little bit of bad behavior go on, more bad behavior can kind of go. Like it's sort of, it can be an entry point for misconduct. So I think the more we can, conversations we can have about kind of culture and um, systems and structures, more so than just these bad apples um, yep. is really important. So that was kind of the, the goal going in was like, how can we tear down something bigger and rebuild it so we can get more women into positions of power and create safer workspaces for everybody essentially. Mm -hmm. um, yeah and also what do you want i mean it feels like the audience i mean i think we all come away feeling like in some way we've all been part of this as well and yeah. and you know what were you you know i mean it's complicated were you were you intending everyone to walk out like the ending is not satisfying because she walks away from us but we don't feel like she's going to be safe and so all of those choices make it feel like it puts the burden on the audience to say, hmm, let's all think about this. Can mm. you just give that up? Yeah, I mean, I definitely was interested in making sure people interrogate their own behaviour after leaving the movie. I mean, that's the point of the movie. And that I think if, if we had have solved the problem by the end, I think people would walk out and go, well, that's a problem that used to happen yeah. before the Me, right, the Me Too movement. Now it's done and solved. It's all good. And I wanted people to understand that it is still going on and try and pick out which of those threads are still happening and what's still happening in our workplaces and how we can fix those. So essentially it's kind of the very bleak ending is is sort of it's sort of a way to express how how kind of unending this process is essentially. But I um wanted to gosh, sorry, I've lost my words. It's late at night. <laughs> I'm losing my mind. Um but I did want to make sure that it was what would I say about it? I guess, I guess what I was in a probably I was speaking to a lot of young women who felt like they didn't have opportunities and had been denied the opportunities they deserved in the industry and seen their male colleagues promoted in ways they weren't. And it felt at the time to me like there wasn't a way out, even though we've made so much progress. It still felt like, oh, we're still so trapped by kind of a system that's structured against us, essentially. So, uh, yeah, in, in essence, that's probably why the ending is so bleak, because that was what I was experiencing at the time, just chatting to so many women that it, a lot of them had left the film industry completely just because they felt like there was no right. path for them. Yep. Um, and so that all needs to be interrogated and changed if we're going to make things better. Yep. Can you actually, Susan Gray um, in comments has said something that triggered um, a question I wanted to talk about. She says, the corporate jargon is just so seemingly banal and it felt really authentic, like wheels up at 7.30. And the role of language in in the kind of bonding and but also in the complicity, in what it hides, what it doesn't say. Oh. It's really interesting, especially in corporate environments. It's, mm. really, it's really sinister. Mm -hmm. Can yeah, you just talk a little bit about, yeah, what, how you interrogated that? Well, even in the construction of those emails, I mean, she's taught yeah. a way to almost yeah. the company line, like the company, pot, the way we discuss this is to kind of apologize for even questioning the boss's behavior and admit it was my fault when it wasn't, you know, all of that stuff. The, the language is all kind of created to protect somebody like this, essentially, I think, and and protect that kind of behavior and allow, allow it to continue. So that was definitely important when we were putting it together, that's for sure. Yes. Um, so one question, Araby Beverage says, this great name, Araby, um, the soundscape is amazing. The lack of any background allows us to completely inhabit the space and the silence heightens the complicity the complicity of silence amongst the entire company about the chairman's activities. Did you know from the start that this would be a quiet movie? Yes, definitely. I wanted to make sure, like I said earlier, about making sure it wasn't, um, I guess, uh, I guess making sure it was an authentic experience. I wanted to make sure that it uh, didn't wasn't emotionally manipulative. And I think often score can kind of change the way you're, um, engaging with a character and the way you're experiencing what she's experiencing. So I really wanted an audience to be stuck in her shoes, to be in the position of being the youngest woman, the person with the least power in a powerful production company and to be experienced the world as she would, which meant very kind of realistic kind of sounds. That being said, I worked with Leslie Schatz, who's an incredible sound designer. And uh, um, I was interested, I wanted Leslie because he had done Gus Van Sant's Elephant, where Right. A lot of like kind of beautiful soundscape created around the school of the Columbine High School. And so 
it was kind of, he created these amazing kind of tension and beauty and nostalgia with sound. And so I wanted him involved and he said, yes, luckily. And so he and I worked together to create this sort of soundscape out of all these sounds that he had people record, whirs, buzzes, hums, fluorescent lights, copiers, beeps, like all of that became, you can kind of create a lot of tension with with those sounds essentially by pitching things up or in volume or in pitch and making them sound kind of different. And there is something you can do in in like, in place of music essentially that does still give that give it kind of an emotional resonance so that was what we were searching for and i yeah it was such a thrill to work with him he was, he's a mm -hmm. genius mm -hmm. um i mean in so many of reviews it's being described as the kind of first or ultimate me too movie so can you talk about what's your what's your response to that i i think there was a few before us actually maybe maybe not maybe we we're pretty early um I don't know. I wouldn't call it. I mean, I'm happy to take any label because it is exploring everything that's yeah. that's that the Me Too movement is exploring. But I do don't want to limit it to that because it is yeah. kind of a story about also just about toxic work environments and like there's a lot of kind of issues it touches on that I think I'm mean, even like talking more about gendered work environments is something that Me Too often doesn't do. Like it, they need to do more of. I think so. I think that. If I'm happy to have the label and happy for that to be a discussion point and a reason for people to access the film and figure out it, it exists, and so that's great. But um, I do think there is a kind of a broader uh, context as well, which um, yeah is yeah, but yeah, <laughs> whatever. People also call it a thriller. They call it all sorts of things. Um, so. Yes. Um, one of the um, questions, Mark Stokes is says, how did you develop the microaggressions that are such a powerful part of the film? Yeah, I mean, every scene kind of has one in the, in it, essentially. Yeah. Every scene has a tiny moment, whether it's even like a paper cut, it's something that yes. uh, is, is making her day more difficult almost. Um, and then it was, I mean, honestly, it was talking to so many women about the end, these, these stories coming up again and again, like this idea that, they're asked to make the coffee or look after the children or those sorts of stories came up a lot. And so that became very easy. And then it's sort of very simple to, I mean, as a woman, I think all of us have had the experience of men taking kind of taking up space in a way that we don't, don't want them to, whether it's in an elevator or leaning over a chair or like all of that stuff became important, like the language of the visual language. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It was a tricky kind of process, but I think each, each scene has a little hint of it essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, what are you or aren't you saying about race? Because it was very, it's very um, tangible how, it, it's very notable how white the office is, it, uh, except the assistant who's a woman of colour. And then we hear the maid on the phone in Spanish. And it feels like those choices are quite, were mindful. Can you just talk about that? I, yeah, I mean, I've been talking to a lot of young women in the film industry, and unfortunately, the film industry is predominantly white, and it was for a long time. And so it was trying to, I mean, I guess in that sense, it was kind of more reflective of the people I was speaking to. But also, I mean, we've got a character who isn't, I mean, this is, gets really tricky to talk about, but I feel like white women, we have a, we're, we have a lot we're to blame too for everything that's gone on. And it isn't just a problem with the men. It's something that we looked yes. away from for so many years. And it's something that we all need to interrogate, us too. So to me, I mean, putting all that, that was something that the character's dealing with. So kind of the complexity of that position um, is it was something that I felt like it was best to explore that way. But uh, yeah, it was, it was, I mean, I mean, I'd love to see a film about a woman of color in her position, because I think it would be yeah. completely, a whole other level of trauma and pain and so yeah i do think there is room for that next yep. yeah um and can you talk about the network of assistants and just the just i mean the structure of it is just so it's it's so staggering how much they're just i mean they literally just have absolutely no power whatsoever and and that she knows that something's wrong. She feels really like she tries to make an intervention because she knows that the girl is walking into something really bad. And then when, when Matthew McFadden's character tells her, don't worry, you're not his type. 
Wow. I mean, just can you just talk a little bit more about where that I mean, that obviously came from like deep research and this yeah, uh, network. But that I mean, that line went out of sight was all over the press. I think it was in a lot of the stories about those predators, not just like the Weinstein story, but the Matt Lauer and like a few of those. But I mean, yeah, if you look, look for it, that that line's everywhere, which is terrifying. Um, yeah, so that was, yeah, a lot of, all of that was kind of, sorry, I'm confused about the question. Is it about how, let's, sorry. <laughs> yes, no, I wasn't very clear. So just, yeah, I guess, first of all, the kind of network of assistants oh, and the their kind of different roles and like Julia Garner's, she, her, her, she's clear in what she's doing. And then mm -hmm. there's suddenly this introduction of this Arthur girl who's, the assistant and then mm. what that throws light on in a way questioning what she's doing and being asked to do like how much research did you do around that how authentic is that and a what lot. were you saying yeah a lot of people had similar experiences of, of women being hired uh for reasons that they felt were suspicious and that this is at a bunch of different companies which is really horrific um and feeling like they were hired for a reason which they but they couldn't figure ascertain whether that was true or not like it bizarre and i'm worrying they're judging somebody in by by thinking that in the first place which is a, sort of a journey julia's character goes on is am i jealous of this girl like where who, who is she compared to me like all that was very tricky um so yeah a lot of that came out of the research to be honest um but honestly that relationship between her and the other assistant was something that on paper was uh, interesting that I was interested in exploring but then when we put the two actors in the room together so Christine who's just who plays the young assistant who arrives is so kind of wide-eyed and beautiful and there's something yeah. that she's innocence to her which makes it so much more heartbreaking to watch the two of them interact and and that kind of tension between the two of them not really knowing how to speak to each other about what was going on and not and trying almost trying to reach out and then figure and being blocked and kind of confused about their relationship to one another uh was really fascinating to explore once they were on that set that day it was like wow there's a whole other level to this which i didn't realize when we were scripting it but the two of them just brought something else out of it for sure um a moment i find really powerful is that is her watching the audition and also the dialogue interestingly i mean i I was obviously projecting heavily, but I can't feel I can't help but feel like even what she's reading and that and that part is is communicating something to us. Can you just talk about that? Because that felt really profound as well. That moment. Um, yeah, it was interesting putting an actor in that position where she's walking into the office and yeah. and you don't know what she, what's going on and what her story is. And I wanted to make sure. We knew a little bit about her and her backstory yeah. and could see that she was strong and not just a weak kind of pushover. Like she has a strength to her. Mackenzie, the actor that plays that girl, um, is incredibly strong. There's something about her presence where you know she's in control and she's trying to, you know, it's really a kind of, and it's a complicated scene that I worked with a, with a writer, Mingju Hai, as an Australian um, filmmaker herself, and she um helped me with that and it was an incredible kind of journey the two of the, the two of us went on with that um but getting that scene right and so it wasn't too on the nose and it wasn't too like obviously uh you know a, a like a, a like i guess it wasn't trying to make sure it wasn't something prepared for that predator yeah. you know but trying to make sure it was something that she could read in an audition naturally um but does have all these these kind of extra levels was important and then i think visually it was like we i was very kind of inspired by there's a scene in um Haneke's code unknown where julia Benosch does a casting video and it's the most incredible scene and it, i i kind of that was a big influence on that scene and because it, it gives that film so much weight and so i really wanted to try and replicate it if i could mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, so there's a question from Rebecca Gallen, um, which is a good seamless segue into talking about your other work. Um, and she asks, how was it, how was it for you transitioning from documentary to fiction? Um, I studied, I went to fiction film school. I studied fiction filmmaking. I made fiction shorts and then I ended up working in documentary because that was where I could get work as like a 23 year old. <laughs> um, that was where someone would employ me. So I was making behind the scenes documentaries on fiction sets. So I was still 
kind of making docs, but being exposed to fiction sets and how they were working. So it was never that foreign to me, this I, the jump. Like it was something that I was educated in and something that I was around a lot. Um, and then with casting John Bonet, the, my last feature, we had a two week fiction shoot with a full fiction crew. So I kind of had that experience of, of having to, you know, give people their cues and making sure their marks are down and you know, all these kind of technical things, which I, I kind of had the experience of because of that, that film, we were able to do that. So for me, to be honest, I look at films, I'm kind of a structure nerd. Like I like thinking about the emotional trajectory that, that the character goes on. And that's kind of the same in doc as it is in fiction. Like with doc, you often have a main character who is going on a journey and trying to figure out what that journey is. And so when you look at the structure of kind of all my films, they have kind of a similar trajectory. So it wasn't that big a leap. And I, but I've had a lot of friends who've moved from non who have more kind of free, I'm very kind of, I love scheduling and I'm <laughs> organized. Whereas my friends that have got these kind of free kind of have like just shoot when they need to and have a more kind of liberal style, I guess, uh, have struggled to really kind of get that done within the 12 hour day or whatever it is that they're shooting within and having to have a full crew waiting when everything is slowing down. And so, but I kind of thrive on that pressure. <laughs> I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, so Ukraine is not a brothel is your first feature and then casting John Bonet your second. Um, and they're, I feel like both of them are really quite radical works. I, I so quite some of the criticism I read around them, so reviews rather, some people um, question your your ethics. Yeah, uh, and I love that. I love that you. It feels like you're not really very interested in those kind of. I mean, I'm not saying you're not interested in ethics, but I'd like you to talk about your kind of quite. It feels like quite radical approach. To telling stories in a way that you feel is necessary rather than the way that things should be done, which is often like get documentary gets bogged down in, I feel sometimes. A little, but I don't know those criticisms when they were talking about the Essex were about casting Jean Bonnet, and they were only from American uh, critics who I think had a big, a lot of the criticisms were the fact that I was making fun of America in a way that I thought was so bizarre. Right. <laughs> but here I was a foreigner coming in, kind of exploring kind of this bizarre fascinations Americans have with this case. And I think that made a few people uncomfortable. So I think it is, it, it, yeah, I can often make work that pushes people's buttons a little bit, but maybe, I mean, that's often what I find most interesting is kind of the subjects that other people are, I guess, are afraid to go near. I'm like, if there's a reason to talk about it, I think all of them have a strong kind of statement that they're making. And I think yes. that, purpose is, is worth fighting for essentially um always so with ukraine not a bro brothel is not a brothel can you talk about how did you how did you find that story how did you get access uh it's it's a stunning piece of work and it's really disturbing as well i'm glad you say that i mean i made it I kind of moved to ukraine with my dslr camera like a tiny little camera, wow. like a camera 5d and, a, and an audio recorder and a little little lapel microphone, one of them, and basically just started shooting this film myself. And then I ended up bringing over my friend who was a cinematographer for a few, couple of months to help me kind of get some more beautiful kind of pretty shots for it. But I, um, it was, and then I cut it on my laptop, on my MacBook Pro, 13 inch MacBook Pro. So oh. I, and essentially all myself really, I don't think anyone, it wasn't, I, I did that and then I kind of, uh, so I'm proud that, I mean, I don't, I think it's flawed. I don't think it's a perfect movie, but I am very proud that I was made kind of solely independently with, wow. you know, the $10,000 I'd saved working in retail. Essentially. <laughs> so like, I think that I, I don't know, I'm proud of that journey. And then it was a film that kind of didn't go anywhere. I didn't think, and then a friend of mine was an actor on the top of the lake and he found a way to slip it to Jane Campion and she saw it and kind of called me up and gave me kind of the, all this encouraging advice and wow. um, and uh, yeah and so I'm very lucky that she was able to be this kind of supportive figure in my career in that sense because she encouraged me to kind of keep going keep submitting it keep writing to people keep doing what I'm doing so all of that was really great um, but yeah so that was a really independent little little thing but okay yeah, it's about a topless feminist movement in Ukraine femin they kind of predated well they did I said kind of but they did predate pussy riot so they were kind of the first 
kind of movement of that kind that we're fighting against the state and it's kind of and sexism and sex tourism in their countries um so i i yeah i just saw a video of them online actually i think i read it in the paper in australia and i thought oh that's really interesting and they were naked with these kind of beautiful ukrainian flowers and it was kind of this beautiful image um and i loved what they were trying to do and how to kind of bizarre their their movement was um topless feminism uh so i just got on a plane and flew there and, and went and met them in a little cafe in kiev and said in bad wow. in, in english somebody translated okay I, I learned a few ukrainian words and then then i slowly and then i said i want to shoot for you i shoot can i shoot a protest and i shot one i think i knew they were protesting shot one like i just turned up shot it gave it to them on a flash drive they watched it they liked it and then i were kind of like sure shoot anything and so I worked with them and learnt Ukrainian and Russian in a year. <laughs> I lived with them too. I lived with six I girls think. in a one bedroom apartment in Kiev. It was kind of the best year of my life, like best of times, worst of times kind of thing. We got arrested a bunch and like, it was really wild and really fun. And it was kind of my first kind of feature film. And I was very proud of kind of all of it. So yeah, it was a great journey. We're going to be posting, it's it's available uh, to watch, so we're going to be posting where, because um, everyone needs to see that film. It's just, it's a stunning piece of work. And it obviously then opened a lot of doors. I mean, I'm re I love the story of Jane Campion. I mean, it really makes a massive difference. Oh, we sure. need to champion each other, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So I guess now, and now you're in a position to do that. Can you just talk a bit about, um, yeah, who else has influenced your filmmaking? I read Chantel Ackerman. Yeah. yeah. Also huge fan. Yeah, Jane Campion was a big part of it because after that she gave me, I think, a job on Top of the Lake 2 as a researcher and I just did a lot of research for her, but I got to watch her process and sort of see it because I was, she was asking me to look into things and I would go back and go away and Google them and kind of come back with all these notes about what I found interesting about certain topics. And I, but just seeing the way she worked was a really big influence on my work and the way I kind of create things. So I'm so grateful for her for that experience. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, Chantel Ackerman's John Dielman, which is a big influence on The Assistant. I mean, anyone that's seen the two movies can tell. They're very, there's, uh, there's a lot that uh, we were influenced by, like gesture, tone, rhythm. Um, but that was a big, I think I remember seeing that in film school and just being like, wow, this is what a movie can be and being kind of shocked by it, how, just how radical it was, but also how quiet it was. It was, um, yeah, amazing. So that was the big, probably a huge influence on everything. And I was very fortunate to be able to kind of create this work that is sort of an homage to it in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, other, we need more women. <laughs> how many do you want? I'll keep yeah, you. who? I mean, who's exciting now? Who would you lift up? Who have you? You know, you could often. I mean, I'm a filmmaker too. You often your film tours at the same time as other movies. Like who? When when you were touring this, who else? What what other work did you see and love? Um, well, I'm a big fan of Kelly Reichardt and yeah. Eliza Hitman, and they're both got films out right now. Yeah. And uh, never rarely, sometimes, always. I believe it's Eliza. Yeah. Film, it's a tricky title, right? Uh, yeah. Which is I think available in the UK now, or maybe just about. We're working on it actually, so it's out um, in the middle of May. Yeah. Great. That's if yeah, she's phenomenal. I think Eliza's brilliant. Um, and yeah, and Kelly Reichardt's first cow is coming out too, I believe. So the two of them are kind of. I was fortunate enough to be around them and get to see their Q and A's, and and that was kind of wonderful. Um, uh, yeah, and then there's so many more, but it's sort of uh, yeah. I'll, I must say, in documentary, Garrett Bradley at, is incredible, and Time, her film Time, which is out this year, it, and I saw it at Sundance, and it was the best documentary I saw at Sundance, hands down. I think it's incredible. So um, yeah, look out for that if you get a chance to see it. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. Um, and what's next, Kitty, before we wrap? Like, what, what are you drawn to now? Uh, I'm not sure. It's been a weird period where I'm sort of getting finished with this project and kind of come, going on to something else and trying to figure out what that is and what that should be, and especially in this time when everything is very confusing. And I think ideas I had for projects are now seem less relevant in amongst all of this chaos. Yeah, it's that we're weird. In. Yeah, so I think everyone's sort of taking a step back and trying to reevaluate and figure out what's important to us and what we should be making films about moving forward. And so, yeah, I mean, it's a time of reflection. Yeah, also, it's going to be, you know, such a tangible kind of like what it does to the creative, like where you set things as well. Like, 
what do we need to say about this time we've lived through? You know, like this market before and after. It's kind of really weird, isn't it, as a creative person? Yeah, I mean, do you have to reference it if you're making a film in the future? Like, will that be will that be overdone? Like, we don't know what's going to happen on the other side of this and how quickly we'll get out of it. And, like, it's all very tricky when it comes to filmmaking, that's for sure. So I guess it is a process and a journey that we go on with this virus, essentially, and figuring out where we where where we're at as we go and last question before we bring sonia back in to also uh, say goodbye um on just bring it back to the assistant i mean i i read a quote where you said it's really important you know centering women and female stories are really is really important to you and you know this film feels like it really does have something to say to to make people question their well, but their behaviour, their complicity. I mean, what's interesting is, like, ironically, offices like that are closed at the moment. They're all empty. And what now will this time have, what impact will that have on, on shutting those places forever? I don't yeah. know. I wonder, but I also just hope we can take this time to think about our behaviour a little bit so that hopefully when we all go back to work, we can all be a little more aware of those kind of dynamics and when they're unhealthy or toxic and when they're, um yeah inappropriate so i guess yeah i mean hopefully that things will be better moving forward and the more conversations we can have like this the better that's for sure yeah and also i mean it feels like certainly you know the like during this time you know we're lifting people up um you know like the frontline workers like you know the people work in the health industry and people who are at the front line in like food provision we're we're realizing how important people who have been ignored and kept to the side and sort of invisible are really essential. And so that feels very relevant to, to the topic of your film too. Completely. I mean, it's a film where you're making someone who's essentially been invisible for so many years yeah. visible. Like you're trying to, and I've had a lot of people who are bosses of companies come and say, oh, I, I haven't really thought about what she's going through, the woman on my desk, and I'm going to treat her a little differently tomorrow. In fact, I might buy her lunch. Like, so yeah, it is, It is. hopefully we can kind of rethink the power structures and make sure they're not as, like the divide between us isn't as great and that we can help each other and, and cooperate, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why also it's really important that these stories are told, for, I mean, not necessarily just this story being told from a female perspective, but just every type of story told from a female perspective, there, there just seems endless opportunities because women have been sidelined in, in filmmaking for so long. Completely. And so I just want, yeah, your thoughts on that, please, as someone who's actively working. Um, yeah, for sure. I think, I mean, often I think male filmmakers take the most sensational aspects and aren't aware of kind of the larger kind of problems. This sounds like a generalization, and it is. But you know what I mean? I think with the assistant, what we were trying to do is not make something that was, that we made something that was kind of deeper and richer and about an experience that every woman goes through and every woman can relate to. And I think that's something because we had a female led crew and a female we were able to do. So I do think the more women we can get making movies, the better and the more kind of perspectives on everything, the better. So yeah, let's give, let's give women more jobs. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, Kitty, we, we did an hour. You weren't sure that we were going to manage it, but we <laughs> had. I know. Uh, we could really seriously easily keep going. Um, <laughs> so I just want to say thank you. I mean, whatever you're going to do, we're there. We're supporting it. You know, oh, your work's definitely. really terrific. Um, I, I really advocate everyone seeing your other work too. Um, casting John Bernays on Netflix. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Just absolute delight talking to you. And, and it's an honour, you know, promoting The Assistant. It's a really important film for us, for everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate your support. Thank you. Great. Um, Sonia, just um, welcome back. Just wanted to say um, welcome and, yeah, if you want to wrap up. Thank you both. That was fantastic. Um, it's it's great to hear from you, you know, um, in this time when cinemas are closed. Um, this is a film that is very dear to us and that we at the Barbican and I'm sure cinemas across the UK are feeling really disappointed not to be able to show on the big screen but it's really heartening to see it doing so well on on VOD and to hear and be part of a conversation like this um so the audiences can listen in and, and hear from you um is just fantastic and thank you for the film 
Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah.